So I'm Mike Lazar, I'm one of the senior staff in pulmonary and critical care, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about unpackaging normal values in cardiopulmonary exercise testing. So in terms of an overview, um, the, um, there's no way that in the next hour I'm going to be able to give a summary about exercise testing as good as Zach does. Um, an exercise test interpretation is truly the combination of understanding cardiopulmonary physiology, pattern recognition, and experience. And over the last year, I've become marginally better at doing this. And we only have an hour today to go through it, so there's no way that I'm going to be able to give a comprehensive overview. So my goals and objectives for today are to give a brief overview about some of the variables we use to use in evaluating a maximal symptom-limited cardiopulmonary exercise test. I'm also going to give you a closer look at how normal values are defined so that we can better identify what abnormal looks like. So just like for radiology conference, there's specific rules of engagement that go through this. At any point in time, if you need me to clarify or stop and re-explain something, please do so. A lot of what my talk today builds upon what I've talked about, what I'll talk about in the earlier slides. But Zach's not allowed to correct me at all during this talk until it's complete. The reason is we potentially might not make it past slide six. And this is slide five. So just to start talking about some important terms, perhaps one of the most important or the most important term that we use in exercise testing is the VO2 max or maximal oxygen consumption. This is often expressed as liters per minute, or on occasion we'll express it uh, by weight base using milliliters per kilogram per minute. A normal um, VO2 max at rest can range anywhere between about 0.9 and 5 milliliters per kilogram per minute, but the standard value that's accepted in most literature is about 3.5, which is also defined as one metabolic equivalent, or one met. With exercise, you can get up to about 30 to 50 milliliters per kilogram per minute, or someone like Ala, for example, will get up to 90 milliliters per kilo per minute. <clears throat> but VO2 max is truly defined as the maximum capacity of the individual's body to transport and use oxygen during incremental exercise, which reflects the physical fitness of the individual. VO2 max is, uh, occurs at the plateau of VO2 measurement, and in the absence of a plateau, we often use VO2 peak to represent it, and it offers prognostic information in disease. So this is a study done by Mancini in circulation in 1991. There are multiple studies that look just like this one, in which they measure VO2 peak in the, in the presence of disease and determine what is a, a cutoff to determine when people do well and people do poorly. Now this is a study that looked at follow about 24 months, and they measured a VO2 peak of about 14 milliliters per kilogram per minute. With this, you see a cumulative survival of the individuals that were greater than 14, that's somewhere great around 80% at two years, where the ones at less than 14 are much, are much lower than this. This is typically why the cardiologists use the cutoff of about 14 milliliters per kilo per minute as the, um, as the point to determine whether somebody's transplant eligible. This holds true in COPD as well. <laughs> So if you, what I've done here in this slide is taken the, the numbers here, which are difficult to interpret and, and right size in your own mind, and t created a, a typical 70 kilogram individual and then put them in red. So if you look at proportion surviving, if you have a, a, um, a VO2 of about greater than 14 milliliters per kilogram at five years in a patient with COPD, they're all alive. If you're between 11 and 14, you still have a, significant high, a significantly high uh, survival rate, about 95% at about five years. But when you drop below 11, so between 9 and 11, as denoted by group 3 here, or by less than 9, as denoted by group 4 here, you start to see a precipitous drop in survival over time. Just so they won't leave anyone out, pulmonary hypertension, the same conceptual thing occurs. If you start looking at predicted VO2 in this study done by Wenzel, they actually use percent predicted. And if you have a VO2, predicted VO2, or a measured VO2 of greater than 65% predicted, your survival looks pretty good at five years. And then as you drop to 45% or 35% or even less than 35%, you start to see significant drop off in how well people do over time. So VO2 is a nice way of measuring how well survival-wise people are going to do over time. 
Okay. The next term I want to discuss is VCO2, or carbon dioxide production. During carbohydrate metabolism, the production of, uh, or the use of oxygen, or oxygen uptake, and VCO2, or carbon dioxide production, are equal molar. If you remember all the way back to second year of medical school, um, or first year of medical school, when you learn biochemistry and the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain, it takes roughly one molecule of oxygen to produce one molecule of carbon dioxide. And that's essentially what happens during aerobic metabolism. If you get people into anaerobic metabolism and you use the glycolytic pathway to create lactate, the VCO2 will increase as it attempts to buffer this increased lactic acid formation. The respiratory exchange ratio, or RER, is, a measure, is measured by gas quantification at the mouth. In a steady state, it's equivalent to respiratory quotient, or R2, which is measured at the tissue level. Oftentimes, you'll hear us interuse inter the terms RER and RQ, because realistically, they're, they're pretty much the same thing when we're measuring at the mouth versus what's going on at the tissue level. The respiratory quotient, or RER, is measured by the carbon dioxide production versus the VO2 uptake. And a normal value is around 0.8. It's based upon ba a basal lipid metabolism. So instead of going through the tricyclic acid um, and the electron transport chain to get one millimolar of carbon dioxide for each one millimolar of, one millimolar of oxygen used, you're going to get some lipid metabolism, which will drive the, the fraction down. You will see this number significantly increase at anaerobic threshold, which oftentimes you'll hear Zach and I refer to the time down curve on the, on the exercise test as being predictive as to where anaerobic threshold is. And some literature will actually support the use of a maximal effort for an RER and RQ of greater than 1.15. So I'm going to take a few moments to now de de define what anaerobic threshold is. Anaerobic threshold is defined at the point in which you switch from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism, which lactate is created. The ventilatory equivalence, which is the graph I'm showing here below, is the most accepted method is correct, although you will see some people oftentimes in the literature refer to the V-slope method. Anaerobic threshold is typically defined when the VO2, uh, typically defined as the VO2, in which the ventilatory equivalence of oxygen, or VEVO2, reaches a nadir and then consistently rises. So if you look at the graph, this dark blue line will come down, hit a nadir point, and then come back up. You can also use some of the other clues in your graph to help answer that as well. So in this, the ventilatory equivalence of carbon dioxide, or VEVCO2, which we'll go through more in just a moment, will come down, come down to a point, nadir, plateau, and then come back up again. The point where it naders is also the anaerobic threshold. And then finally, the last thing I'll point out on this graph is this is the RER, the RQ, in which you'll, you'll see the value come down, nader, and then start to go back up again. And that's where you would define, roughly define, anaerobic threshold. I wish they were all this easy, unfortunately. I want to do a closer look at the anaerobic threshold um, and what you see with the VEVCO2 because this is actually going to become important a little bit later in my talk. As I mentioned earlier, with your VEVCO2, you will come down, hit a nadir point, plateau, and then come back up. This plateau region right in here is, this, is defined as isocapnic ventilation. What is that? Well, the lungs are, for a short while, able to efficiently, effectively buffer the acid load that's created in anaerobic metabolism. When the acid load exceeds the ability of the lung to exhale carbon dioxide, you will see the upward reflection of this graph. In other words, your VE increases at a more rapid rate of your carbon dioxide production. Two points on this graph I want to point out. One is the anaerobic threshold, or AT, and the other point is over here is the ventilatory compensation point, or VCP. This will become important later in the talk, and I'll go through that more specifically at that point in time. So this is a standard Excel spreadsheet that we use, that the fellows use, in order to um, help interpret a cardiopulmonary exercise test. And as you can see, there are lots of numbers on this page. Again, there's no way that I'm going to be able to go through all the numbers on this page. But suffice it to say, this is essentially a normal exercise test. The numbers that I want to draw your attention to, or the values that I want to draw your attention to, is this number here, the VEVCO2, or ventilatory equivalence of carbon dioxide. 
in the past, what we've done is we've identified anywhere less than 35 at anaerobic threshold as being normal. I'll talk to you a little bit more later as to why that's probably not the most accurate way of defining it. The second variable that I want to look at is heart rate. Truthfully, I'm not all that interested in heart rate at rest, at aerobic threshold, or at maximal heart rate. But what I'd like to do is spend some time talking about what happens to people's heart rate at the end of exercise and how that may be predictive to tell what's going on with the patient. And the last number is one that you don't see on our Excel spreadsheet, but you will see on the, um, you will see on the VMAX PDF that comes through in EPIC. That's the end tidal carbon dioxide. I'm going to talk about each of these uh, specifically at, all throughout our talk today. So what I want to do first is start with the ventilatory equivalents of carbon dioxide. <coughs> if you harken back all the way to the first and second year of medical school, this is the ventilatory demand equation in which um, there are lots of variables. Oftentimes we pseudo-quote this in the ICU as to which things are determining um, minute ventilation on the ventilator, and the only thing we tend to plug in is the arterial carbon dioxide production. But the other things that go into this are the production of carbon dioxide, a constant. This constant is typically 860. It converts pressures of standard temperature air at standard temperature and pressure and converts it to body temperature and pressure, essentially just moisturizing the air and, um, incre and increasing the temperature. And the last thing that I'll talk to you about is the dead space to tidal volume uh, ratio over here um, on, in the denominator. So what I'm going to do is some simple manipulation and just bring the CO2 over to the left side of the equation. And then on the right side, you see the constant over 1 minus dead space to tidal volume ratio and the um, PaCO2 on the right side. Now this is higher level math and trying to figure out, well, how does minute ventilation, or how does the VEVCO2 and the dead space ventilation interrelate? And because of that, I talked to my daughter, who's in algebra, and I said, well, what happens, what happens when one goes up versus one goes down? And she assured me that as the dead space to tidal volume ratio goes up, the VEVCO2 goes up. So this number correlates directly with dead space ventilation. And you can see that. You see increased dense space ventilation when you measure VEVCO2 in disease states. You'll see it in congestive heart failure, you'll see it in pulmonary vascular disease, and you'll see it in pulmonary parenchymal disease. But the other entity that can drive up your VEVCO2 is hyperventilation. So if your, your VE goes up and your corresponding carbon dioxide goes down, then that will also drive down the ratio or drive up the ratio depending. So your differential diagnosis of a VEVCO2 going up can be disease state or hyperventilation. So how do we measure VEVCO2? Well, there's lots of ways that they do it in the literature. And this is just a small smattering when you go through it. So you can measure the VEVCO2 at the lowest number, the nadir. That's a ratio. You can measure the anaerobic threshold. That's what we do in our lab. And that's also a ratio. You can measure the VEVCO2 at peak exercise. You can measure the slope of the VEVCO2. Well, when you measure the slope, you need at least two points. So which points do you use? So you can measure it from rest to the ventilatory compensation point, which I pointed out a little bit earlier. You can measure it from rest to anaerobic threshold, rest to peak exercise, or anywhere else in the middle. So how do we figure out which one to use? And why does it matter? This is a, a slide I lifted from the internet, which I thought was a really nice illustration as to why it matters which one we use. In this, they actually use the slope method, and the author decided to measure the, the VEVCO2 slope from rest to anaerobic threshold, and it's just slightly abnormal at 34.5. But if he measured it rest to peak in this patient, it's really abnormal at 42.6. And if we measured from anaerobic threshold to peak, it's even more abnormal. So how you measure it actually defines normal and abnormal. This is a study done by Ingle and colleagues in which they looked at rest to peak and then compared it to rest to ventilatory compensation point. And you can see in this graph, it gives you a nice illustration, that as your minute ventilation increases significantly as you hit an increased acidosis, you start to notice that this line becomes not as linear. And therefore your slope would have to go up, making the value higher. So rest to peak is not always a linear number. Keep that in the back of your mind as I go through my talk. 
So which way should we use to measure VEVCO2? This is a study done by Sun et al., published in the Blue Journal in 2002. It's his Hansen's group, in which they actually measured multiple different ways in normal patients to try to figure out, okay, which is the right one to do. And what they determined is the lowest VEVCO2 has the, has the smallest confidence intervals, therefore it's the most accurate. The problem is, is these are normal people, and you don't know how this affects abnormal people or people with disease states. But what I will tell you, when they compared the VEVCO2 at anaerobic threshold, which is what we do in our lab, you see a wonderful correlation and a slope of 0.97, which is close to 1. So you could argue that the VEVCO2 at anaerobic threshold, which is what we do, is as accurate as what is considered to be the most accurate. As you start to measure slopes, your accuracy goes down. So here you have a correlation coefficient of 0.85 with a, with a line that's still pretty close to 1, but not quite as accurate as, you, uh, as looking at the eyeball test. So once again, when we measure these in patients, and the cardiologists measure them in patients, it may look vastly different. And the reason is, is we measure them differently. Some other things that affect VEVCO2. This is from the same Sun study in which they looked at patients and then they started uh, dividing them out based upon individuals' gen uh, sex as well as their age. And it turns out, if you're a female, or excuse me, if you're a male, you tend to have a lower VEVCO2 at, an, at any given level than if you are female. Moreover, as you get older, your VEVCO2 goes up. In the most recent iteration of the Excel spreadsheet, Zach has incorporated this, and now we can actually see how the VEVCO2 is different for each person, not just a blanket number of 34. Now, if you don't determine what anaerobic threshold is, again, this may be the easiest value to pick, the lowest VEVCO2, we're, again, not entirely clear how accurate it is in disease states. <clears throat> okay. So this is a study that looked at congestive heart failure patients and compared them to healthy subjects. They looked at a VEVCO2 slope and they used rest to peak and they took all of the healthy subjects to try to define what is the upper limit of normal. So in these 68 healthy subjects, they found for normally distributed values, the upper limit of normal is the mean plus or minus 1.96 times the standard deviation, which gives you a value of about 34. This is where the magical number of 34 came from uh, on the Excel spreadsheet that we have always had there before. And then these authors then compared the patients with congestive heart failure and said, well, how do they do? And it turns out if you look at patients with a VEVCO2 with a slope of less than 34 and you look at them at over, over two years, they have a pretty good prognosis. But if you take the same group of patients that have a VEVCO2 of a slope of greater than 34, they actually have a worse prognosis and the p-value is statistically worse. Once again, I'm going to remind you, this is measured as a slope from rest to peak. The cardiologists take this one step further then and say, okay, well, we see all these, the, the abrupt increase in the VEVCO2 from ventilatory compensation point to peak exercise, so why don't we just use the group to ventilatory compensation point? And in this study done by Engel and colleagues in 2007, they actually quantified this and said, well, the log rank statistic was greatest for the full slope. They could tease out the difference between the people that were less sick and the people that were more sick easier if they used the entirety of the slope line. Which is why when you look at a cardiopulmonary exercise test done in the cardiology department, you will get one number and it will say slope. And that's what they'll tell you is this specific number. The entirety of the line. <clears throat> so this is um, a study done by Git, published in circulation in 2002 in which they looked at a whole bunch of different characteristics of individuals looking at survivors and non-survivors. And the, the things that would predict outcomes in these patients, age, left ventricular ejection fraction, new heart association class, were actually um, different between the two groups, the survivors and the non-survivors. But the thing that may have best predicted how well these individuals were going to do was a VEVCO2 slope of greater than 34. So if you look, I told you the peak oxygen consumption at 14 is a really good predictor of outcomes. And it does. It gives you an odds ratio of death of about 3.4. But the VEVCO2 slope value of less than 34 versus 34 
when measured from rest to the ventilatory compensation point, gives you a higher odds rate ratio, odds risk ratio. So it actually may be better prognostically to tell, um, to look at your patients from this if they have congestive heart failure as opposed to the VO2. And this, <clears throat> this is also from the CHUA study that I showed you before. If you look at all the, in the incremental um, values in congestive heart failure, <clears throat> whether it be age, peak oxygen consumption, VEV, CO2, left ventricular ejection fraction, the only one that looks to be clinically significant with the confidence intervals is the VEV, CO2. Everything else goes through the origin. Okay, so let's, now that I've spent uh, the last 10 minutes discussing heart failure, maybe I should bring this back closer to home and look at pulmonary hypertension. So as I may mention in one of my earlier slides, the VEVCO2 is really a surrogate marker for dead space ventilation. And as patients have increased pulmonary artery pressures, their dead space ventilation or VEVCO2 slope will go up and has a nice correlation coefficient with a p-value of 0.01. Moreover, this is unique to individuals that have legitimate pulmonary hypertension that doesn't go away. In this study done by Ray Brook, what they did is they took normal controls, they took people who had pulmonary hypertension associated with a left to right shunt, then they closed it and measured the VEV SO2 and compared them to individuals that had pulmonary hypertension. So individuals that are normal, individuals that normalize their pH are vastly different than the individuals that have pulmonary hypertension at baseline. This is a study in which we looked the, there was a, um, a whole bunch of outcomes that were looked at, a whole bunch of surrogate markers that were looked at, um, and trying to define what, are the be, what would be the differences between the survivors and the non-survivors. And these are the values that our pH team typically looks at in individuals that have, um, that have pulmonary hypertension. Their pulmonary artery pressure, their cardiac index, their VO2 or maximum oxygen consumption, and for those of you who have rotated through the exercise testing, O2 pulse is basically a surrogate marker for stroke volume. But none of these were actually statistically significant. Whereas if you look at the VEVCO2, both at anaerobic threshold as well as the slope when you use rest to ventilatory compensation point, those were important. In addition, predictors of outcomes were um, individuals that could exercise more. So the more you could exercise and the less dead space ventilation you had with pH, the better your outcome would be. This just graphically shows the exact same thing. So on the left side, I, I show you the ventilatory, the rest of ventilatory compensation point. That's the VEVCO2. And the magical number they use in this, in this part is 60. Where on the right one, we use the VEVCO2 at anaerobic threshold. That's what we measure here in our lab. So if, as you can see, if your VEVCO2 is less than 60 or less than 55, your outcomes are pretty good at, 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 a, at about two years. Whereas the ones that have very high VEVCO2s have poor outcomes over time. Let's bring it even closer to home and look at patients with COPD. This is a study done by Netter. You can't comment on Netter during the okay. okay. Um, in which he looked at individuals with um, differing stages of COPD. He looked at about equal, um, equal amounts of uh, patients with gold stage 1, gold stage 2, and then gold stage 3 and 4. So a pretty nice smattering of patients that, uh, that we probably see in our clinic every single day. They're old, they have moderate obstruction on their PFTs. So during the univariate analysis, there's lots of things that help predict outcomes. But on the multivariate analysis, there were only a few. Things that you would expect. Age, BMI, the B of the Bode index. The Charleston index, which is a predictor of survival in patients with multiple comorbidities, kind of like the dyspnea scores that we get in our, in our patients with, um, in, in the Bode index. The inspiratory capacity, the total lung capacity, I won't spend a great deal of time talking about this today, but it's a measure of static lung hyperinflation. How much, how in, hyperinflated are these individuals at baseline? And the only thing on the exercise test in the multivariate analysis that predicted outcomes was a VEVCO2 nadir of greater than 34. And this is the graph that goes along with that. If you look at all cause mortality over the course of many, many years, the VEVCO2 of greater than 34 is predictive, 
if you have a bad VEVCO2 and static lung hyperinflation, i.e. both, your, your outcome is even worse. So high dead space with hyperinflation is bad in patients who have COPD. And the same thing occurs in the respiratory mortality um, on the right-hand side. Okay. In summary, the VEVCO2 is predictive of mortality in pulmonary hypertension, COPD, and congestive heart failure. And there are multiple ways of measuring it, and you have to be clear when you're looking in the literature as to which one they actually used. The VEVCO2 nadir is likely the most accurate, at least in normals, but the VEVCO2 at anaerobic threshold correlates nicely with the nadir and has been studied very well in individuals that are sick. The slope is important and meaningful when individuals have congestive heart failure from rest to peak, but it's unclear how it relates in patients with pulmonary disease and in individuals with undifferentiated dyspnea. If you have a VEVCO2 of greater than 34 in COPD, it worsens your prognosis. For pH, greater than 50, a VEVCO2 at anaerobic threshold of greater than 55 worsens your prognosis. And if you have congestive heart failure and your rest to slope um, rest to peak slope is greater than 34, that worsens your prognosis. Okay. I'm going to shift gears and talk a little bit about heart rate recovery right now. So, in cardiovascular uh, health, parasympathetic tone relates inversely with progressive cardiovascular disease. So, the higher your parasympathetic tone, theoretically, the less cardiovascular disease you should have. The initial increase in heart rate during exercise is manifest by the loss of this vagal tone. And recovery after exercise is a function of vagal reactivation. So a reduced heart rate recovery is associated with increased sympathetic drive and probable impaired parasympathetic activity. This is a really nice study published in 1989 in which they looked at this um, firsthand. So they took individuals that were normal, that's this this, the filled in circle dotted line. And they took patients that have congestive heart failure, which are the open circles, and then the triangles, which are the patients post transplant. Individuals that are normal have a nice increase from a, a low basal heart rate to a high uh, exercise heart rate, and then a very quick recovery over about four to five minutes. Individuals that either have congestive heart failure or individuals that are denervated post transplant because they don't rehook up the vagus nerve after a heart transplant. Those individuals have very poor increase in their heart rates and then very poor decrease afterwards, arguing that patients with congestive heart failure behave very similar to their transplant, in, uh, to transplant patients. This is a study done by Cole in 1999 in which they looked at all patients referred to the Cleveland Clinic for a dyspnea evaluation. They excluded individuals that had known coronary disease or had coronary disease very early on in their evaluation and then they measured their heart rate recovery after one minute. In the study, the median value was 17 beats per minute, and they looked at a cutoff value of about 12 beats per minute. When they looked at that cutoff value of 12 beats per minute and looked at these patients over time, they saw this whopping change. Individuals that had a heart rate recovery of greater than 12 beats per minute had a significantly lower mortality than the people that had a heart rate recovery of less than 12 beats per minute. It's a fourfold decrease. The same thing happens in pulmonary hypertension. The only difference here is the cutoff. So if you look at the heart rate recovery in one minute and you use 18 as your cutoff, the individuals that have a good heart rate recovery greater than 18 beats per minute have a very low mortality, whereas the ones that have a heart rate recovery of less than 18 beats per minute have a worse prognosis. Moreover, when you look at these patients, it's actually predictive of how sick these people are. So if you look at the people that were sicker, the heart rate recovery of less than 18 beats per minute, 70% of them had functional class 3 and 4. Whereas the heart rate recovery of greater than 18, 78% of them had functional class um, 1 and 2. And you'll notice that this is distinctly different between the two groups. Moreover, their pulmonary artery pressures were not that different. So this may be a way of physiologically telling the difference between the two without looking, in lieu of the fact that the echocardiograms may look very similar between these two patients. <coughs> 
The other thing that the heart rate recovery does is it mirrors all the other surrogate endpoints that you're looking at in a cardiopulmonary exercise test. The, the people that have poor heart rate recoveries have lower predicted VO, lower peak VO2 levels. They have lower stroke volumes. The VO2 divided by heart rate is, again, the oxygen pulse. Again, the surrogate marker of stroke volume. And they had higher VEVCO2 levels. This happens in COPD too. So if you exercise people with COPD and then you measure their heart rate recovery after a minute, the people that have heart rate recoveries of greater than 14 beats per minute do better than the ones that have less than 14 beats per minute. And finally, just so I don't leave out any group that we take care of here in, the, in, the, in our division, the same process holds true in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So a heart rate recover of 13 beats per minute, when you look at about three and a half years here, the mortality is significantly better than the individuals that have the poor heart rate recovery. Okay, so this is just a summary slide looking at this. So if you have a patient that ha comes in to the, to the, um, for a test with dyspnea and the heart rate recovery is 12 beats per minute or more, they have a lower relative risk of death, fourfold less. pH, the number is 18 beats per minute, and the hazard ratio of death is 1.19. In COPD, the, ha uh, the, the heart rate recovery parameter is 14 with a hazard ratio of 7.3, and in IPF, the hazard ratio is 5.2 with a cutoff of 13 beats per minute. So one of the questions that I had when I was reading these articles is, well, sometimes when you exercise, you develop increased parasympathetic tone. So can you train people to actually have better parasympathetic tone and reduce their risk? And this was a study done by Myers, um, published in 2007, in which um, they looked at patients with congestive heart failure only and enrolled them in two months of cardiac rehabilitation. As you can see, the trained group had a significantly improved VO2 post-exercise, or post-training, um, post and they had improved work at, uh, at the end of training versus the individuals pre-training. The control group, there was no difference between them both before and after. But unfortunately, when you look at the heart rate recovery in these patients with congestive heart failure at one minute, there was essentially no difference between the two. Now, this study has not been replicated for individuals that exercise longer than two months in congestive heart failure-based patients. But it has been studied in pulmonary rehab. So in this study... You, they, uh, they looked at patients both before and after rehab and looked at their beats per minute recovery here at 16.2 before rehab and here at 18.4 after rehab. The number is statistically significant. In addition to that, after rehab and before, before and after rehab, you start to see again the surrogate markers of how well somebody's doing with an improved VO2 peak, an improved or a reduced VEVCO2, and an increased workload. So perhaps in our patient's rehab is doing a whole lot more than um, just getting them to walk on the treadmill. Um, and you can measure it, perhaps, by looking at a heart rate recovery. The only caveat I will say to this is that these individuals have to have a maximal exercise test in order to measure the response one minute post-exercise. So you can't just have them do, for example, a six-minute walk test and find they didn't give the best effort and then expect that you're going to get a heart rate recovery that's going to be meaningful to you. Okay, so the last variable I want to talk about today is the end tidal CO2 pressure. So end tidal CO2, or end tidal pressure of CO2, or PET CO2, is used as a non-invasive estimate of arterial carbon dioxide pressure. During exercise, the the main difference between the two is related to the respiratory rate because expiratory CO2 typically does not reach a plateau. And as you would expect, for a given alveolar carbon dioxide, the lower the respiratory rate, i.e. the lower the minute ventilation, based upon the ventilatory equation I showed you earlier, the higher the end tidal CO2 level, or the higher the ar uh, arterial CO2 level. The more time between breaths, allows for better communication between the alveoli and the pulmonary artery, allowing for excretion of, the, uh, of carbon dioxide. Now, 
I took this from Wikipedia because creating that graph earlier was, was very time consuming and this basically did the, entire, the exact same thing and I didn't have to spend the time creating and moving blocks around on, the, on PowerPoint. But on the left side of the equation you see the dead space to tidal volume ratio again and then you'll see uh, here arterial PCO2 minus exhaled CO2 divided by arterial CO2. That's roughly equivalent to alveolar dead space and you substitute end tidal CO2 here. So now I once again ask my daughter, what happens, how does end tidal CO2 relate to dead space ventilation? And she assured me that as the VDVT increases, the end tidal CO2 should decrease. And that's illustrated here. So this is a study done by Hansen, published in Chess in 2007, in which he looked at normal patients. And in the normal patients, what he did is he got a resting level end tidal CO2 and determined that to be the baseline dead space ventilation. As these individuals start to exercise, their end tidal CO2 goes up, which makes sense. Their dead space goes down because they're utilizing more of their alveoli. And as they continue to exercise past anaerobic threshold, you'll notice here that the dead space ventilation will increase again. There are some normal values that are published on this. The most, the most uh, classic ones are the ones here done by Hansen. And what I, will show, what I will reiterate again is that from rest to anaerobic threshold, you'll see an increase in end tidal CO2. And then from anaerobic threshold to peak, you'll see a decrease again in end tidal CO2, almost giving you an a, a, a inverse letter V. This is a study that looked at end tidal pressure of carbon dioxide patients in three different groups of people. These people were all highly trained athletes, but they found that the highest trained athletes, medium trained athletes, and lowest of the high trained athletes had different end tidal CO2 pressures. They all roughly have the same dead space at baseline, but individuals that can exercise more and have better fitness can get to higher levels of end CO2, partially explaining why they're so much more fit. These are the medium exercisers and then the lowest of the exercisers. And you see a pattern, again, increase to anaerobic threshold and then decrease to peak. So let's now go back to that Hansen study I just quoted moments ago. He actually did the same this study and he incorporated individuals that have disease states. And disease states look really no different to us than highly versus less highly trained athletes. So if you have patients that have COPD, left heart failure, or pulmonary arterial hypertension, their baseline end tidal CO2 levels are lower than that of the normal population, arguing they have more dead space ventilation at rest. In the patients that have COPD and left ventricular failure, you will actually see an increase, as we did before, of end tidal CO2 to anaerobic threshold, and then a decrease from anaerobic threshold to peak exercise. The thing I will draw your attention to is that is not the pattern that's seen in patients who are pulmonary hypertension who are sick. If you look at patients with pH, this is the, a phenomenon that you typically only see in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, and they have to be sick patients with pulmonary hypertension. I'll show you in a minute why. These are individuals that drop their end tidal CO2 with unloaded activity and drop it even further to anaerobic threshold. When these individuals start to exercise, their dead space goes up, and that's the only disease state in which you'll see it. I'm going to spend two minutes talking about congestive heart failure. As you can see in this, the end tidal CO2, again, just what I talked about before, you have a nice increase to anaerobic threshold and then a decrease from anaerobic threshold to peak exercise. The other thing that I'll draw your attention to is that end tidal CO2 at anaerobic threshold, the actual measurement at AT, if you plot that against peak VO2, there's a nice correlation between the two. So end tidal CO2 at anaerobic threshold may actually also mirror peak VO2. And if you take these, uh, <coughs> oh sorry, 
And if you look at it and compare the groups between the two in congestive heart failure, the end tidal CO2 at peak exercise is a better predictor of outcomes than any other things that we're using, including VEVCO2, uh, oxygen pulse, peak VO2, left ventricular ejection fraction, and any of the other things that you want to talk about. The chi-squared analysis shows that this is the most profound of all the variables in, uh, at peak exercise. And if you pick a, a cutoff value of 30.9 at peak exercise, the individuals that have it of greater than 30.9 die less readily than the individuals that have a, one of less than 30.9. All right, let's jump back to the pulmonary hypertension that I was talking about earlier. So this, the phenomenon that I made mention to does happen in which you'll see a reduction in um, end tidal CO2 from rest to, uh, to anaerobic threshold. But it doesn't happen at high VO2 levels. This looks like a normal patient to you. Increased anaerobic threshold, decreased to peak. Even at VO2s from 65 to 79, you see still an increase and then a decrease. But when you get VO2 levels of less than 65% predicted, and you see a drop in the end tidal CO2 from peak to anaerobic threshold, or excuse me, from rest to anaerobic threshold, that's typically indicative of a patient with pretty significant pulmonary hypertension. Moreover, one of the few things that actually has been studied is in this study done in, um, in 2007, they looked at well, how does treating pulmonary hypertension meaningfully affect this outcome? We know that end tidal CO2 patients, or end tidal CO2 measurements in patients, if, if you can improve it, that um, a, a higher level is better than a lower level. And if you give a patient something that reduces their vascular, their vascular pressure, it actually increases. Whereas the individuals that got placebo had a continued decline in their end tidal CO2 over time. Okay. So in summary, there's a lot of data that we collect from a patient's cardiopulmonary exercise test. A VO2 at peak exercise is probably the best predictor of outcomes. But there's other things on that test that are meaningful too. And I'll, make you, I'll alert you to the VEVCO2, the heart rate recovery at one minute, and the end tidal CO2 or additional variables that may be clues to an underlying cardiopulmonary pathology or how severe your patient's underlying cardiopulmonary pathology is. So I want to give a special thanks to, to Zach. Um, there is absolutely no way that I could have given a talk like this a year ago. I want to thank you for your patience and your mentorship. And on the right are my children, Shane and Brooke. Um, Shane is the one on the left who is my algebra checker to make sure I didn't screw anything up. And Brooke was um, kind enough to actually sit through me give this talk last <laughs> night. She, she paid attention the whole time, and the only thing she alerted me to do was to talk loud and slow, and I hope I did that for you guys today. Um, happy to take any questions. Please. So we've been trying to get the fellows to do for years here. And that, uh, Mike kept mentioning that the VEVCO2 making it synonymous with dead space ventilation. The pulmonary hypertension, one of our fellows, uh, Shabon, who graduated at Nice Arts, they put a chess magazine on this, that we need to, somebody really needs to study that hasn't done yet. It's more than that. It's more than dead space ventilation. Uh, people that have pulmonary hypertension, when that curve goes down the VE to VCO2, or I'm sorry, the end tidal CO2 up the anaerobic threshold. It's felt now that part of that is a hyperventilatory response. They're hyperventilating to drive it down, unlike congestive heart failure that still goes up. Uh, now the question is why they're hyperventilating. Is it because they're more acidotic than other patients are driving that? Something unique to come to hypertension? Or is it because uh, uh, they're just hyperventilating due to some stimulatory mechanism? There's something different in the pulmonary vasculature and a, you know, make it cross the bands, who the hell knows, to, to, to stimulate the uh, ventilatory drive. You only see it like the stage three and four patients. So what I keep kind of encouraging the fellows to do, if somebody can think of a way, to, it shouldn't be that hard to study, really. You might have to, you might probably have to do it invasively to figure out why they have that hyperventilatory response that's unique to that disease state 
and not others. Uh, is it acidosis or actually hyperventilation? Uh, Could it have to do with the fact that most of the patients who are functional class late three and four drop their cardiac index with exercise, which is different than how heart failure? And possibly, possibly. But you know, there, there's so many possible explanations for it. But it's such a unique phenomenon to see that. And you know, when you see it on an exercise test, when I'm reading there, you know, of course, we see so many pulmonary hypertension patients. That's one of the first curves we look at now. Is, is how fast that falls. Uh, one of the problems I've, I've had for years with the heart rate recovery, you know, that's something you can see on every tracing that's uploaded now. They rest the patient for a minute or two. It's easy to look at the heart rate, subtract it by a minute, divided by whatever on there. Part of the reason I haven't used it is, I don't know if you saw any resolute in that in the literature you're looking at, uh, Mike, but you need a, you're such a pure population. Most of our patients are beta blockers, which totally screws up that response. Low dose, high dose, you know, in the recovery time. And it makes them look a lot healthier than they are on that. Um, you know, they just, uh, the recovery seems to be so much faster when they're on a beta blocker. So it's, you know, I've kind of found over the years that we can gain that information so much better, useful stuff with the BVCO2, with the VO2, with the 18, this other stuff that we don't record it all on that. But I don't, I don't recall seeing anything in the literature on that either, another project, uh, correlating that, the recovery time, to what therapy they're on. Because personally, I think you can really fool uh, someone in the interpretation if they are on the beta blocker that's going to make that recovery make them look a lot healthier than they really might be. So are these cards, and a lot of times in the critic literature, they don't really differentiate if they're on beta blockers or not. The, or they throw them all in one bag and kind of lump them together, you know? Yeah, the, li the studies that I looked at, none of them excluded patients based upon beta blockade. Yeah. The only thing I'll, the only caveat I'll say is that um, most of the time the it's not the beta it's not the sympathetic activity that's returning the heart rate to normal it's the parasymp it's the reinstitution of the sympathetic activity um, there's there's a couple of animal studies that did this real nicely once they looked at I think it was dogs in which they severed the vagus and then they looked at um, heart rate recovery of dogs after letting them putting them on a treadmill or something and then, and the ones that didn't have parasympathetic activity didn't recover their heart rate as as, as readily but I don't know, you know, it's hard, to, if they don't tell you that it's an exclusionary criteria, who knows wh who goes on one side of the of the randomization, or who goes on one side. You did a wonderful job, though, it was a great Thanks. talk. Um, I will make one comment in regard to Netter now. The reason Mike made that comment there, because we've kind of gone back and forth, that I teach a lot of courses, that I just found out recently that he doesn't even use his own predictive values and he does exercise tests anymore, so it's <laughs> just a funny joke with us now. <laughs> No, just to touch on Ron's last point, um, do you ever see comorbid people at COPDs and LB failure too that show the same signal as pH patients where they drop no. that into LCO2? No. And so I'm wondering if you have someone who's got very inefficient ventilation but also can drop their cardiac index. Never have. Put together. It's Never just have. pulmonary extension only. You know, the only time I've seen it happen otherwise is people with true hyperventilatory states, people with metabolic arrangements like, you know, you know renal failure something like that, they already have an underlying, you know, metabolic arrangement that's driving their ventilation, liver disease, and then you'll see those fall. But that's, again, you know, based on the equation of EDVT, if you had a blood gas, it would mean that's not the, you know, they're, they're just hyperventilating. Yeah. You don't see that very often, but every now you have a of those. That was really good. Thanks. Thanks.